the first very important update is uh, to talk to your staff about whether you have any fabulous photos of your city that you want to submit to be on the league's newly updated and retooled website. You can use this handy dandy QR code to uh, access the portal so that you can uh, update and share your photos. Um, just so you know, Bountiful's already submitted our photos. So you'll be competing for second place in submitting your photos, but that's still worth competing for. Uh, all right, now that everyone's kind of settled down, the most important agenda item for today is that we need to adopt our September 16th minutes. Hopefully everyone had an opportunity to thoroughly read them and enjoy them. It sounds like Gary Hill, way in the back, is making a motion to approve them because he did thoroughly read and enjoy the minutes. Do we have a second? Mayor Tran second. So all in favor of approving our September minutes, please say aye. Any opposed? Awesome. My job is now done and I am going to turn the agenda back over to Justin to take us through the rest of this agenda. All right, thank you um, and welcome everybody. Um, see if we can get our, am I controlling slides up here or is it down there? Okay, there we go. All right, a uh, couple of things just to talk about, right? The first, um, we'll remind you maybe again at the end, but upcoming meetings, there will be another LPC in November, um, on November 18th. Um, that one will be before the next legislative interim meetings. November is the final legislative interim meetings for the interim. Um, so after November, we don't we don't see everything again until January and we start the session. Um, if it looks like last year, we expect to see a lot of bills uh, show up in November. So the next uh, LPC, the next meeting here, uh, we will likely be taking positions and talking about bills that will be coming up um, in that interim a couple of days later. So stay tuned for that. Um, also, Local Officials Day uh, is on January 22nd, second day of the legislative session. Um, that's coming up way faster than we would like to admit. Um, but for those of you who haven't heard that one yet, Local Officials Day will be on uh, the 22nd. Um, just pulling up this slide, this slide is an old slide. You've seen it before, um, but I, I just thought it was uh, interesting to show that the themes that we had from last legislative session sure look a whole lot like the things we're still talking about right now. Um, Partnership, not preemption. State doesn't have a surplus in either cities. Affordable home ownership and sustainable infrastructure. Data matters. Year-round session. I can't believe we're actually at the interim uh, end of interim all, already next next month. This is wild. Just everything that is old is new again, and we're going to be talking about all of those things. Um, one reminder now, and we'll we'll remind you again. What would an LPC be like without some slido questions? Um, so. The, the ask that we have right now, and again, slide up, we'll ask again, is to put your name in, um, like your real name, not a funny name, uh, for the, the, the questions. And the reason is, we're also going to be sending out a Qualtrics survey after um, our meeting today. And we want to be able to match stuff up so that if you change your mind, if you answer differently, we can match things up. Um, so just please put in your real name. That will help us collect in data. Um, and with that, I'm going to turn the time over to Molly to talk homelessness. Excellent. Hi, everyone. We actually have quite a bit to go through today with homelessness. So just where we're going, updates on winter response in code blue, updates from the Homeless Services Board, and then ongoing policy discussions that we have been having. So first, um, I just want to take a moment to acknowledge that through all of your work, the county's work, the state service providers, the philanthropic community and more, there are actually more than 1,100 beds coming online this winter for people in need across the state. And uh, I just want to go ahead and like congratulate you all on that, everyone on that for that collective effort. This issue is hard and feels intractable. And I think a lot of times it doesn't feel like we get to see the finish line. And I just wanted to take a moment and flag that that's a huge accomplishment to have over a thousand beds in the state that were not previously there. And so good work to all of you on that. Um, and so with that, winter response plans are now active for the counties that have them. They are active October 15th through April 30th. As a reminder, winter response plans are time bound. So they are 
October 15th through April 30th through the winter of 2025-26 for counties of the first and second class. Um, so just keep an eye on that. If a county elected to pursue a permanent solution like Davis County did, they are only responsible for code blue. Code blue is also starting to come online and that is temperature driven and applies to counties of the first through fourth class and it does not have an end date. So code blue is with us to stay. Um, as a reminder, it is triggered when it is 18 degrees or colder, including wind chill for more than two or two or more hours within 24 hours. Um, these are all the sites where you can see. So like Summit County recently had a code blue activated. So just know that we are getting into code blue season. Uh, all the information is on the slides. We'll post them so you can access that later if you need them. Uh, but you should have access to all of that. As a reminder, there are a couple things. Code Blue really just prohibits what things that you can't do. Um, so you don't necessarily need to affirmatively provide anything as a city. But if, for example, a church wants to open up in your jurisdiction during Code Blue nights, as long as they're meeting fire code requirements, you cannot prohibit them from doing so. A, a big change that we had this last year is that you may now enforce a camping ordinance. However, you cannot take anyone from anything that they would need to survive in the cold. So you can say you can't camp here, but you can't necessarily like take their sleeping bag or anything that they would need to survive. Um, Mayor Overson pointed out in the comm last week that this did present a bit of a interesting technical challenge of how can you actually enforce an invade a camp if those things are used for survival? It is a great question. I think it's something that we might need to kind of revisit the code for some more clarity this winter. Um, also wanted to give you some big updates from the Utah Homeless Services Board. So last year, in or last session, uh, uh, Representative Clancy's Bill 298 established the Homeless Services Board. They are the governing homeless body for the state. And they, we discussed this last time in our LPC meeting, they were debating the centralized campus versus the satellite campus model. And they voted to pursue a central campus model they are looking, they directed OHS to identify three viable locations with 30 plus contiguous acres to develop a central campus on the Wasatch Front. Those locations need to be cited and reported to the board by December 15th. Um, the master plan is by October 5th or January 15th. And then they are hoping to have 1200 low barrier beds located on that campus by October 15th, 2025. Um, they've outlined the role of the current resource centers. The plan is to keep those online. It's not to completely move away from the satellite campus model, but know that they are pursuing a central campus and they are looking to facilitate public input from stakeholders. Um, about a week and a half ago, I was invited by OHS and the board to go visit Haven for Hope in San Antonio, Texas, which is a centralized campus that serves about 1,600 people in the greater San Antonio area in Bayard County. Um, I'm happy to chat with any of you about that if you would like, um, and we can go from there. Other features, um, they adopted the administrative rule for how shelter cities can qualify for funding. They did ultimately take the rule that the Shelter Cities Advisory Board was suggesting, um, but they are looking at how they can kind of incorporate additional provisions and requirements into contracts. The big issue we're facing right now is that, and some of you may feel this, is that the system is seeing camping and unsafe camping and kind of what shows up in your municipality is a municipality's uh, failure in solving for homelessness and not in what is kind of a visible failure of every other upstream factor going forward. And so we really wanna make sure that as we engage in conversations as cities, both shelter cities and non-shelter cities alike, that cities are being held responsible for their role in the system, but not responsible for the system writ large. And so that's something we are really working on. And again, this gets to the third point, which is not a policy right now, but is more of a strategic vision. But the board adopted Utah's guiding principles to overcome homelessness to complement the state strategic plan. And in that, it identifies that there is reliable, unsanctioned camping and loitering enforcement in all municipalities. 
Um, I flag that because we are seeing laws in uh, Florida and a ballot provision in Arizona that is requiring camping enforcement in all municipalities and holds municipalities legally liable if any business or individual uh, sees fault or feels victim to their lack of enforcement. So just know that those are conversations and policies that are happening nationwide, and we want to make sure that Utah cities are, again, not being penalized for systemic failures. Um, so again, ongoing policy and conversations we're having. Code blue and winter response, we're talking about that. Davis County cities are meeting at the end of LPC to discuss uh, what that can look like there. The mitigation fund will likely need to be revisited and may need to be revisited this year. With 1,200 beds coming online, it is going to upend the current system we have, upend the current model we have. And so that is likely a conversation that we will need to have that may impact everyone. Um, and then it also looks like we may be getting some code red provisions to, again, keep people safe when it is dangerously hot outside. If there are any questions, I'm happy to answer them. If not, you can catch me after and I'll turn it over to Justin. All right, thank you. All right, I just took the long way up. All right, uh, a few a few updates from uh, from Andrew in the last week. Um, <laughs> this first one, we're trying not to laugh about it, but we care about ma massage parlors suddenly. Um, Yes, I heard some chuckles. Thank you. So uh, the Office of Professional uh, Licensure Review um, is it's a it's an office that's been around the last couple of years. It's fairly new, but its job is to go around and look at different uh, different offices, different entities, different regulations, and see if there's anything that should be deregulated or that mm -hmm. regulation should change on. And massage parlors are something that they looked at this last year. Now you may be asking, why do we care about massage parlors? I'm gonna tell you. So one, massage parlors are a business and those get licensed at the municipal level. Um, what they are suggesting is the massage parlors should also get licensed and therefore better tracked at the state level as well. And again, if you're saying, why are we caring about this? It's because if you look there at the bottom, um, massage parlors um, have been known to be used as fronts for illicit activities. So we see sex trafficking, we see sex work, and we see human trafficking um, sometimes going through these massage parlors. And because of, because of some of the licensing regulations that we have in the state, um, there are some easier ways for people to, to get some lower level licenses that, that we have than some other states have. Um, so... The only reason that that we really need to be aware of this is is one they were asking questions um, about changes to business licensing and nothing will be changing at the municipal level. Um, but if someone wants to run a massage parlor, uh, massage business, uh, massage therapy, then they need to first get the municipal business license and then show that to the state when they go register with the state as well. So nothing changes on your end. It just goes to the state. The other part is if they find um, issues that show up there, so um, they find out that people are, are doing illicit activities, if they find other issues, then there may be a notification coming back down to the municipal level uh, to let you know that their license had been revoked, there's problems, there's a warning, whatever that may be. So not anything that's going to be a big change, but it is something they reached out to us about, just want to put it on your radar. Um, feel free to ask any questions about that one if you'd like to. If not, we'll move on. Mayor Burton. Yes, massage therapists are already required to have a license, um, but not necessarily to run the business. So, and there is a separate, to, to get into the nitty gritty, there's a separate um, the licensure they can get that's not just a massage therapist, but we have, it's sort of a, a lower, simpler entry level license. It's a massage assistant. Um, that does not exist in many surrounding states. And that's an easier thing to get um, with less hours and less regulation around it. And because of that easier entry point, that's where we're starting to see some of the issues creep in. So again, nothing big changes on your level other than you may start seeing a notification in a year or so from the state saying, you know, we're revoking this license of, you know, whatever business or we're finding issues, whatever that may be. So not a big change, but one that is going to impact us just a little bit. So yes, we are going to have to take a position on massage parlor bill. Just getting you ready for that. Oh, Brian over here. Yeah. Hey, Hey, Brian. 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 Hey, Brian.
So the question is, um, if the city's getting a notice from the state, will that mean the state's doing some kind of enforcement? Potentially. We're waiting to see what the language actually looks like. Um, so what would happen is Doppel could take action against that person's license, um, and that may put something against the business as well. But we're still waiting to see exactly what that language looks like. And I think the notice, yeah, if there was something, yeah, criminal, then, well, if there's something criminal, then, that was, they found by reviewing that license, yes, that would come down to the local law enforcement. Yeah. Lynn, question. No, that was similar to my question, and that is, if the state revokes their license, are they then going to turn around to the cities and say, you need to enforce her? That just needs to be clarified as to right. who has the enforcement responsibility. And I think, yeah, and that's where we're waiting to see the language on, but that is a good clarification. Um, based on the conversations we have, I think it would just be referred down to local law enforcement to say, here's what we're finding, here's what we know. Um, but again, we'll, we'll probably have more language next month to come back and say, here's specifically what the language says. So thank you for those questions. Any other questions on this? All right. Um, Mike Winder is going to come up and talk to us about utility liens. Um, talk about this. We we presented this in last week, um, and by we, I mean uh, Mike and Jared, because I was in a different committee watching massage parlors, actually. So um, massage parlor issues. Let me clarify that one. Um, you were giving big, the massage. This is a dangerous either. topic. It gets hard to get, easy to get sideways quickly. Um, but Mike, why don't you talk about uh, what happened last week in political stuff? Justin, what you need for that massage bill is a good acronym. That uh, I, I can't wait. There's someone in the session will come up with a good acronym. We're just going to move on to liens now. So a long time ago, uh, cities would often provide their own power and water. How many cities out here, just show of hand, have their own water or power system? A bunch of you. But then uh, the newer cities, whether you're Mill Creek or Taylorsville or Herman, you, you don't, right? And so we have other utilities now, as you know, whether it's a stormwater utility fee, whether it's uh, garbage, whether it's uh, solid waste recycling, even the transportation utility fee. There's no way to really collect those by putting a lien on a property or, or anything else under current statute. Um, I've reached out to some of my city manager colleagues around the state and some in this room, and they said, yeah, we just threatened to shut off their water bill or their, their water or their power, and that gets their attention real fast, which it would if you had that option. A lot of the cities don't have that option, and so we're proposing that we should receive the same authority that special districts have, which is you can put a lien on a, on a deadbeat who's not paying their bill. Uh, Kern's Improvement District saved one full FTE when they made this change a few years back on the special district side, just because instead of running around playing collections, you threaten a lien and they, they're pretty good to pay, or at least you know you'll get the money in the end. So we took it to, to interim su uh, political subs this week, and they unanimously voted to make it a committee bill. Uh, ledge staff tells me that we'll likely have it before November interim. It's a pretty simple fix. It just gives cities the same authority that special districts already have in code. Um, it doesn't mean everything to a lot of you, but it'll mean a lot to some of us, especially as we get looking at uh, transportation utility fee or other fees down the road. So that's the, the two minute version. Okay, perfect. Lynn, question here or comment. Mike, is that a lien on the real property? Yes. Even if they're just a tenant? Yeah. That's how the special districts do it and it gets attention, it works. Hey, any other questions on this one? If we only had a good Slido to go with we this. We do have a great Slido. Okay, maybe so later. Make sure. All right. And with that, we're going to jump over to Slido. Um, so join here, scan it, or you can go to slido.com, put in the number 4012042. And as a reminder, please do put in your real name as you put this in so we can match things up later on with some of the Qualtrics questions. All right, still see a couple of phones up. I'm gonna give you 10 more seconds. All right, so the question that we have for you on this one, um, just since we're presenting this for the, the first time here, and the QR code is still up there if you need it, would your city support a lien tool to collect delinquent utility payments authorized by the legislature? So is this something that your, your city would would like? So give you just a, a couple of seconds to respond to that one. And like Mike said, there's a very good chance that 
Uh, this is a simple fix. It gets drafted before November interim, and we bring this back uh, in a few weeks and just take a position on it. So this will this will help us as we get ready for that. If I click over, is this still open, Carson? Okay, I'm going to give it just a couple more seconds then. I think we have a good idea which direction it's going, though. All right, we're going to jump to that one. Uh, Cam, I'm going to have you come up and talk tourism taxes. Howdy, everybody. It's great to see so many folks in person here. And then we've got several dozen online as well. It's almost as if the legislative session is around the corner with an election here in just a couple of weeks. And this October of an election year is always a little tricky up at the Capitol. I think it's fair to say, Justin, last week at interim, there was a lot of talk, but not a lot of action because everybody's waiting to see what happens on election day. But we've been told, and this is what always happens historically, that when the November interim arrives, everything hits. It's just going to be a full-on avalanche because they know who's going to be in office in January. They'll have had leadership elections. So there are a lot of concepts that are on the back burner today that in two and a half weeks will emerge. And so part of our objective today is make sure you know all the moving pieces so that when bills do start flying in a few weeks, we're ready to start bringing them back. A couple of those are in the uh, tourism and transportation utility fee spaces that we've just encapsulated right now as revenue. So on the tourism and related taxes, uh, this conversation has occurred on and off again at the Capitol for really most of my career. As a reminder, each level of government actually imposes a different tourism related tax and each tax has its own set of rules about how the money can be spent. And there is going to be um, a serious conversation in the 2025 session around potential increases and potential changes to tourism related, uh, I say tourism and related taxes. So that includes the TRCC that goes on restaurants or on rental cars, as well as the county TRT, the municipal TRT, the state TRT, um, and even potentially the resort community tax or the handful of cities that apply there. At this moment, I can't tell you exactly what that'll be, but we've been told by several key legislators that they are doing a deep dive and they want our feedback of what this could look like as well as feedback from the counties. So if, the, if this issue impacts your community directly, please, if you're online, drop Carson a note. If you're in person, grab one of the league staff because we need to put together a work group and we need to do it pretty quickly uh, to start working through the status quo and then figure out areas where we'd like to see improvements uh, because we do anticipate maybe as soon as the November interim uh, framework starting to come together with some ideas from state leaders around tourism taxes. So today's ask is just on the volunteer side. Also on the revenue side is transportation utility fee. As a quick reminder, last year we had House Bill 367, which was a response to litigation at the Utah Supreme Court with Pleasant Grove, where the court upheld that Pleasant Grove's transportation utility fee was indeed a fee and not a tax. But that court case did not rule on the reasonableness of Pleasant Grove's fee. It remanded that to the lower court, and then ultimately the, um, the plaintiffs withdrew their litigation. So that question was left unanswered of what is reasonable for a transportation utility fee, reasonableness being the fee standard. So last year, we worked through uh, what we refer to as a difficult but doable process, uh, based on principles that the league board adopted, the LPC voted to support House Bill 367. It passed the House unanimously, passed out of Senate committee, and then did not come up for a vote on the Senate floor. Yes, yeah, a couple of jokes in front. Yeah, it did not, it did not come up for a vote on the Senate floor because of uh, opposition to the bill that came up uh, late in the session. So there are several ways this could turn out in 2025. One is we could just have status quo right now that there is no bill. Uh, the Supreme Court case would be the law of the land and each city would do your own process based on that overarching framework that it's a fee, not a tax. Uh, second option could be we rerun House Bill 367 at this point, Representative Karen Peterson, who was our champion last year, and said she doesn't want to run a bill that won't pass the Senate, and that bill, as currently drafted, uh, won't pass the Senate. 
We are hearing serious rumblings of two potential options in 2025, one that could either reduce our legal authority to impose the fee or reduce our ability to levy the fee on all users. So either way, it would cut to the authority of cities. So House Bill 367 did not really affect the legal authority of cities to impose the fee. It simply codified the process and defined what reasonableness meant in that setting, but it did not change our underlying legal authority to impose a fee. We are hearing rumblings that there may be bills that would impact our ability to impose that fee. Now, rumblings don't mean bills yet, but we want to make sure it's on everyone's collective radar because as you're having meetings, hopefully in the next few weeks leading up to the session with your legislators, we've asked you, in fact, I don't have the, the handout with me, but we passed out at annual the the housing hand the housing handout to talk about infrastructure and to talk about what your city is doing to plan for growth. But another key component here will be to talk to your legislators about the difference between general service fees and uh, fee, or excuse me general general service taxes and fees for specific uses. And we'll put together a little fact sheet to help you on that as well. So right now, the ask on tourism is if you want to be part of the work group, let us know today. On the transportation utility fee, just be aware that even if your city's not interested in ever doing a transportation utility fee, where this could go could end up impacting fee authority for all cities. So be, be prepared there. And in particular, Kaysville, thank you for sitting in the front row so I could uh, see you. And then I know I saw Farmington here. Yeah, Farmington, you know, three rows back. Uh, after this meeting, let's just have a quick rendezvous with uh, Kaysville and Farm. Oh, and more Kaysville. Look at that. Uh, yep. Sorry, I saw Nate in the back after I called you guys out here. So uh, Kaysville and Farmington, let's have just a quick rendezvous with your two cities because I think uh, the key next step will be your two cities. And we can talk more after LPC. Okay, Justin, back to you for water. Carson's going to follow me up just to make sure I don't do anything bad. All right, so I, several water water issues coming up. Um, uh, the first one um, to talk about is, uh, if you remember back from uh, way back when, in 2023, uh, there was uh, legislation passed to do a study on the use of property tax uh, to pay for uh, water infrastructure. Um, oh, we're going to jump ahead to that one because that's what I started with. All right, so uh, Senate Bill uh, 34 um, out of 2023 uh, required the Department of Natural Resources, then ultimately Department of Water Resources, uh, to do a study. Now, the, the study is out there. Um, I'm trying to find if it's posted somewhere, um, but it's a 100-page study, actually a 101-page study, um, that talks about, one, how property tax is used, how water infrastructure is funded, um, and, and, and a lot of other things around that. Um, but two big takeaways from it that I just wanted to share today, um, and that'll, that'll inform some of what's going to come up. So one of the big questions, if you recall back from 2023 and even the interim in 2022, was should we get rid of property tax as a way to, to pay for water infrastructure? Uh, basically take that away from the conservancy districts. So you'll see number one here, the recommendation is do not eliminate property taxes. Um, so the study came back and said, property taxes are, are a good way to fund infrastructure. It's a good way for bonding. Um, so the study did not come back and, and say we should get rid of property taxes. The second takeaway here that I want you to be aware of um, is to implement more aggressive tiered rates for tiers three through four to discourage excessive water use. Now, there are many more um, recommendations, um, and we're going to share the study. We're going to talk about it more in depth, but I just want you to be aware of uh, that top line one to not eliminate property taxes because that was um, essentially kind of the, the start of the bill and where that was coming from. Um, but one of the things we are going to see a lot of discussions about um, more from the study is how do we pay for the expanding infrastructure? I mean, this is something we talk about with the growth, but um, between uh, Department of Water Quality, Department of uh, Drinking Water, um, the Water Commission, Representative Snyder, there are a lot of different discussions around how are we going to pay for water infrastructure, what do rates need to look like. Um, so we expect to see a lot of discussions around this. So the ask here is we're going to need another working group because I'm starting to see a lot of different bills, um, potential bills, we'll call them rumblings again, like Cameron said there, um, that are going to come up. So 
we need a work group to help us talk about water fees, infrastructure funding, particularly around water. So if you're interested in helping me out on that one, uh, shoot me an email, jlee at ulct.org. Um, I have a feeling we're going to have plenty to talk about and, and multiple pieces of legislation that we're going to need to talk about on this one. Um, so that's the ask. Um, we will share the study out there. Um, again, it's a 101-page study. It's it's long. There's a lot of discussion around there, and we're not going to spend a lot of time talking about it right now. But just looking for for individuals. Um, so whether you're interested or if you want to vol volunteer somebody in your city um, to to be involved in this one, um, feel free to shoot me an email, and we can put you on that. With that, I'm going to go in reverse order here. Uh, stormwater amendments, another water bill. So if you recall from last session, HB 507, uh, which was construction amendments, it wasn't called stormwater amendments, um, uh, passed uh, last, last night of the legislative session. Uh, this is a bill that uh, we negotiated heavily, heavily, heavily on, excuse me, um, wasn't a bill that anyone was terribly happy with, but it, it passed nonetheless. Um, so I'm gonna do this slide in reverse order. So here's the reminder, HB 507 is law. It will be in effect on January 1st, 2025. So as we're negotiating on the new bill, we are not working to kill changes to stormwater. That's already in law. They're not gonna repeal it. It's not gonna get pulled back. The best we're gonna get is trying to clarify things and making a bad bill somewhat less bad. So just as a reminder, and I know this is for all of you, but I'm just gonna say it again, it is going to be law if we don't do anything. If we do things, we can make it a little bit better. So that's just to maybe save the paragraph where someone sends me an email and says, this is a stupid bill. Agreed. That's what we're working at is we're trying to get it to be better. Um, so there are a few things that we're working to clarify. One, um, the bill last year said that the only way to do inspections was electronic through photographs. Um, we're looking to get some changes on that one and clarify what an electronic on-site inspection looks like. So the feedback that we got, um, not just from the cities, but also from the builders, is they weren't particularly excited about the electronic inspections um, either. So looking to get clarifications around that one. Uh, clarifying timelines for the review of plan submissions, uh, and then clarifying when fines can be levied and when a work site can be shut down for non-compliance. So giving you a preview of kind of what we're looking at. There's been a group looking at this throughout the, the interim and appreciate those who've been helping on this. Um, there is a good chance that we see a bill on this one before the next interim because uh, Representative Musselman, as many representative senators are, are going to want, is going to want to try to get something, I think, on the agenda for November and see if they can get a committee bill out of this one. So nothing really to take a position on today. We don't have any specific language for you to review yet, but just want to, to remind you that that one's out there and that we're working on it because it could come up uh, fairly quickly. Finally, uh, there is a bill that we have some language on. So water usage amendments uh, is being proposed by Representative Doug Owens. Um, and this is what the bill says. Um, after January 1st, 2026, overhead spray irrigation cannot be used for commercial, industrial, mixed use, or multifamily development or redevelopment. Okay, so getting rid of overhead spray irrigation um, for those, uh, basically for commercial uh, development is what they're looking at. So it is not single family detached homes is what we're talking about here. Mark. Yep. Good question. Don't know. Thanks. I can look it up and see if it see if it says, um, but I'm not sure if it does or not. Norm, yeah. What's overhead spray irrigation? Basically, so to find basically spray irrigation, anything that sprays out instead of dripping stuff. That's a good question. Thank you for that. Um, so why do we care? This is what the bill says. This is the direct bill language. So a municipality shall require an owner of a specified land, so that definition we just had is the specified land, to comply as a condition of approval of a land use application or issuance of a land use permit and include notice on um, or with the land use approval or land use permit for a specified law stating, Utah law prohibits the use of our head spray irrigation for your project, except in outdoor activity areas, which are basically like sports fields and stuff. Yeah, Cliff. We pushed back on this one last year with Doug Owens because mm -hmm. what we found was we, we have park areas that we have no intention to put large areas of grass in, but we needed to, to get some of the natural plants to uh, get established. 
and we have significant discussions. And this was how it was affecting places like our community, because they were basically telling us we had to put um, underground irrigation in to do things that we might use once or twice a year. So it, this was an issue that we'd we didn't anticipate it administratively until our, our parks guys saw it and realized that that was a problem for us. Okay, yeah, that's a great point. So the other the other piece of this is um, a municipality is encouraged. This is not a required. This is an encouraged to review and either approve or disapprove plans for outdoor activities um, or inspect specified land for compliance with the section. So not required, but encouraged to review and either approve or disapprove or to inspect them for compliance. Um, we're going to share this bill. I'm going to share the language specifically at, with the LPC follow up. Um, would love specific feedback on this one. Uh, I'll give you a minute to digest it when we send it out there. So we're going to send you the bill language because we do have the actual bill language with the LPC follow-up. If you have thoughts on this, if you have um, issues on this, would love to get them. I'm not take a position on it right now because um, it's not going to be up. We're going to have another interim or another LPC before we get to an interim meeting. But would love to get your feedback on this as we send it out there. So yeah, Cliff, nor Mark, send me your thoughts um, when we send this out there. I know you will. So any any other questions or thoughts um, as we have this up here right now? Hmm. This is the, the, the only other comment I will make is last year, Representative Owens did run this uh, bill that dealt with uh, government properties. This year, looking at commercial properties, uh, I do expect the trend to be at some point he'll run something looking more at uh, single family detached. That's just, just the direction the trend is going, I believe. Um, I may be wrong on that, and we'll see. Um, but just would love to get your feedback on this one so we can so we can give him feedback and also when it comes time to take a position um, on where the bill goes. And with that, uh, we're going to do a Justice Court update. Um, this is a quote from an email sent by uh, Senator Kurt Colomore um, to the members of the Justice Court uh, Task Force. And this is what it says. After consulting with my co-chair and others involved, we have made the decision to discontinue the task force's activities at this time. There was more e in the email than that, but the takeaway is the Justice Court Reform Task Force is done for right now. Um, there may be other things that come out of specific legislators who decide to work on something, but the Justice Court Reform Task Force is no more um, as of last week. So if you've been worried about Justice Court Reform, you don't have to worry about it right now. Not going to be an issue uh, coming up this le next legislative session. You feel free to applaud if you want to, <laughs> or applaud if you are unhappy. Roger. Um, yeah, Norman, then Roger. So I would say we do have to worry about it because this, uh, to me, looks like a veiled threat that the committee is now dissolved and not functioning, but that doesn't mean nothing's coming. Um, I would say... It Knowing some backstory that I'm not going to get into right now, I don't think that's the case. I don't think something is coming through the back door. Um, nothing's coming this way right now. Yeah, I, I won't say, oh, I just say, sorry, Roger, any legislator can run anything they want, but the legislators who are working on this issue are not planning on doing anything. There's a lot of factors associated with this task force not doing this. There's an interesting backstory, but there's also the reality is this there's no way they could come up with the amount of money this was going to take. But I think, and I hate using the word worry, because I think there are some structural issues with justice courts, even if they're left intact, that are going to happen. And I don't think things are necessarily bad. I mean, in, 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 basically, I think we've got to have some structure about how, how many justice courts we have and where they're located. I mean, we have some counties that have no municipal justice courts at all. Everything is moved into in, through the county, Washington County, except for one, one community. Cass County has nine justice courts in, in their cities. And so I think there's some organizational issues that are have nothing to do with reform, but do have serious issues with reorganization that I think we ought to be looking at. Mm -hmm. The other issue is we continue to have cities who are closing their courts. So that is the, it is not a status quo issue, and it is all, all being driven by outside interests. Mm -hmm. I think the, the issue is we have something that is part of a state system. The cities are rethinking what they want to do with it. 
And that's going to drive this issue. Yeah, and that's yeah, that's a good point, right? The the other thing I'll bring up on this one is, you know, we sent out a, a survey, got a lot of great information and data back on that. Uh, so thanks for helping us out on that. Carson went through it. Uh, we are planning on sharing the data with the courts just so they're aware of what what we learned from you. Um, so that in the future, you know, when discussions come up, we have some of that background. But for this year, it truly, I don't see anything going forward. And with that, Carson, short-term rentals. Thank you, Justin. Um, this will be fairly brief, but I wanted to let everybody know that the short-term rental study will be published today. Um, it's the I's are still being dotted and the T's being crossed. So I don't have it for you quite yet, but we will send it out in either the LPC follow-up or very least Friday facts. And you should be able to find it on the Kempsey Gardner Policy Institute's website uh, by the end of the day. But I want to just have a couple highlights that I think are really impactful. First, they were able to identify an almost 40% increase in short-term rentals statewide between 2021 and 2023. Most of those having occurred in uh, three or four counties um, adjacent to uh, tourism areas. Um, they also, this year, were able to look at census tract level data for housing and compare that with short-term rental locations. And we're able to actually sort of look at the impacts. And um, as many of you know, that the impacts were by far and away most acute in tourism areas. But one of the concerning things was they found that the number of short-term rentals in tourism areas are growing at a faster rate than new housing units are coming online. So you're actually at a net loss. So I won't spend too much time on it today, but I wanted to let everybody know that um, I know we've mentioned this a couple of times, but I want to let everybody know that this study will be available. Um, we're really excited to see the results. And then um, we're also optimistic that this will lead to more dialogue at the Capitol this year on short-term rentals. Um, those of you who've been involved in the short-term rental work group know that it's been sort of a, a push and pull over the last couple of years to try to figure out what, what sort of uh, balanced policy looks like here. Um, but we've, we've heard your feedback. We've been um, talking with some legislators about possible changes. I don't have any um, like solid direction yet. I don't have a crystal ball of knowing where this is going, but I want to let everybody know that it's very much in um, in the discussion, whether it's at the Commission on Housing Affordability, whether it's with individual legislators or um, in any of the other, other legislative venues. So uh, please uh, look forward. We'll um, continue coordinating with our short-term rental work group to try to guide policy going forward. Um, hopefully we'll have a more comprehensive update for you at LPC next month, but all of those concerned about this issue, I just wanted to let you know that it is um, dialogue is moving forward. So um, with that, I will uh, turn it over to Jared uh, for Lundy's task force. Okay, great. Okay, we wanted to give you some updates and also get some feedback on some land use issues. Um, that we're currently dealing with. For those of you who don't know, Land Use Task Force is a body uh, where developers, home builders, and the league, uh, among others, uh, come together and try to uh, resolve uh, conflict and uh, see what we can do to come up with solutions. So uh, the, the first item that uh, we would like your feedback on and kind of want to make you aware of is uh, the building permit application process. Um, and I should mention this, that they're, they're, uh, the, the three items that we're going to be discussing today are quite technical. So uh, if you've got any questions uh, after I'm done, I'd be happy to answer those. So the, the first part that uh, I wanted to review is under the code, technically, uh, we have an indefinite amount of time to review the building permit application for completeness, whether all of those documents have been submitted as they should have, which are under the code. Uh, we then have uh, 14 business days to do the planning uh, review, the plan review. That means uh, all of the different departments in the city should be doing their, their plan review and get that done within 14 days. Um, and the concerns of the home builders that have been brought up is this is taking too long. Uh, we have delay before the plan review even starts that there are, um, we're not even being told that there's a, a deficiency in our plans or the documents that we've submitted and that they're not there. Um, they also are saying that uh, cities are refusing to accept the application as complete until everything is perfect on the on the plans, and then the 14 day starts. Um, 
There's also complaints uh, that uh, cities are taking advantage of that timeline of the 14 day shot clock and when that begins. Um, with that being said, uh, the conversation that we've had and tried to explain to them is there's concerns on our side. What we're receiving, uh, the billing uh, permit applications that we're receiving are uh, very, very incomplete. And uh, and that that's what we're receiving. Those uh, documents are are uh, um, unhelpful, and so we don't want to start that 14 day sh shot clock if all we're given is a pile of uh, documents that are unhelpful, that are not uh, part of what uh, the code says that they have to uh, provide. So. With that being said, uh, trying to come up with with a solution that provides them with some uh, some uh, consistency and some reliability, uh, along with us being able to get good plans and not be on this fourteen day shot clock if we're receiving plans that are incomplete, uh, the the uh, the current and I should just emphasize that the current. Uh, proposal that we've been discussing right now is is this that we would add onto the 14 days five days uh that in addition to the 14 day plan review and if you took longer than five days to notify them that the plan application or the uh, building permit application was incomplete that eats into the time of the building permit plan review so you've essentially got 19 days for single family homes uh, to, to do both the review for completion as well as the plan review. Use it as you wish. Uh, that gives them, so if you, uh, the, the second thing there, uh, the screening period, if you take 18 days to, to determine whether all of their documents are in and uh, then, then, uh, then you've lost 18 days uh, and you have one day to do plan review. Uh, vice versa, if you get that done before, then you have more time to do that plan review. So you've got you've got that time. Uh, so currently that's that's where we're at with um, and look at that. I put it all on the slide there. Um, the the uh, so that's that's the timing part of it. The second part is the resubmittal of plans. Currently, there is uh, very little option to have the builder come back and resubmit their plans if their plans are uh, um, less than uh, helpful. In other words, if they uh, go against what the building code says, or if if the city has concerns, there's there's no real mechanism except for geotechnical concerns that would allow us as cities to come back and say you need to actually resubmit these plans not just a a red line or a note on on the plans but actual resubmission you need to re there's there's a lot going on here and currently we've set up four different areas where uh, we would be allowed to require builders to resubmit their entire plans. Uh, life safety concerns that are significant and would render the dwelling uninhabitable. Uh, land use regulations or building code requirements that would require substantial alterations. And we're still working through the, the language there. Um, environmental safety concerns associated with drinking water, sanator sanitary uh, sewer, uh, or stormwater. And then lastly, deficiencies addressed by a third party reviewer uh, in a geotechnical report. So those are those are the um, redefining what would allow us to re require the builders to resubmit their plans. Uh, so with that, we wanted your feedback on how comfortable you felt with that, uh, those different changes in those proposals. Again, I just reemphasize that uh, this is the most current uh, uh, negotiations and things change quickly. So um, it may change.
that working, Carson? Should I be seeing something? Okay, good. Okay. Yes. So that five day period, would that be business days? That 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 would be business days. Yes. Carson, you tell me when I can, uh, I don't know how many have had a chance to respond or not. See, this is, this is awesome. He's awesome. So that shows you how many. Okay. Um, and just so everybody knows, we, we try to, um, we have a little tech kick up. We try not to show the responses in real time just because we don't want that to influence other people. We want it to just be like your open, direct feedback. Uh, we don't want somebody to say, oh, everybody else is comfortable with this and I'm not comfortable with this and feel peer pressured into changing your answers. So that's why we try to, to hide results. Sometimes Slido overrides that in the middle of a meeting. So um, that's, that's a little bit of context there. Thank you. <laughs> Okay, on to the next uh, item. Thanks, Mark. Um, uh, we are, uh, we, if you have any other further feedback on that, please, please get with me and uh, that would be very helpful. Uh, the next thing I'd like to talk about is uh, bonding and financial assurances. So th these are uh, bonding mechanisms that allow us to make sure that the improvements that we are requiring of them, public improvements, uh, are built to according to code. And when we go and inspect, we need to make sure that there's a financial assurance that one, they're going to be complete, and two, after usually a year of warranty period uh, that they are built uh, correctly and still uh, in accordance with code. So we listened to your feedback. We we brought back to the land use task force uh, uh, a hard no on surety bonds. Uh, we know how difficult those are to collect on. And uh, instead of a cash bond or a letter of credit, escrow, um, and so we pushed back on that and, and, uh, and we got somewhere. So, um, the second thing is, is that we, uh, the, the, uh, additional proposal is to come up with a uniform structure of release currently right now in code, it says that we have to provide a, a, uh, a structure by which we release those bonds incrementally. So if they've completed some portion of that project, then we release some portion of that bond. Uh, and so the, the proposal would be that uh, with e within each of those categories that you see, culinary water, sanitary sewer, uh, stormwater, transportation, et cetera, that uh, each in each of those categories, as those uh, systems are completed, we would release for that particular system 90% of that category. Uh, and, and then after the warranty period has expired, we'd release that 10%. Uh, and that would be in each individual category. So if, if they've completed in accordance with city standards, the streets, transportation, uh, we would release that 90%, even though maybe the sanitary sewer or stormwater has not been, uh, well, those would, uh, uh, public landscaping, let's say. Um, and those would each independently be released uh, in each category uh, ninety percent and ten percent. Many of many cities already do this, and if you looked in your code, I would be there is. I, I would assume that there would be some sort of system similar to this. So it shouldn't be that much of a change. Um, wanted to make you aware of that, and then, uh, but there's there's uh, the PRC is currently reviewing the bonding language. 
Uh, there is one aspect that we would like your feedback on as well. Before I hop to that question, are there any other questions um, that, uh, that we have with one and two? Okay, so uh, let's see here. So this is the this is the question that we'd like your feedback on. Currently, uh, and unfortunately, I'm just going to read this because this is easier to understand. If a land use authority determines that the installation of required subdivision improvements or the performance of warranty work does not meet the municipality's adopted standards, the land use authority shall and this would be an addition within 15 days, give a comprehensive and specific list of the reasons for the land use authority's determination. So this is a punch list, uh, either uh, at time of completion or uh, at warranty. And so after, after warranty and the inspection is being done, uh, under the code currently, we have to give them a comprehensive and specific list of those items that need to be corrected. One of the concerns that the home builders are having is we're not being given that list. We request it, but we never get the list. So we can never do anything about what the city wants us to change. And that way the bonding is held up indefinitely. I don't think this happens often. Um, I don't think that this would affect any of your cities. Um, but this is their concern. I think it's pretty reasonable to ask for 15 for us to be able to get back to them in 15 days, a list of their uh, of the things that they need to to complete. Um, their their uh, the most the most uh, the their draft said if you don't complete it within 15 days, then you have to release the full bond. Um, we we pushed back on that idea and said, well, uh, we understand the reasoning behind why there 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 has to be if that's what you're facing, there has to be some sort of remedy for them to say we need our bond release, we need to move forward, and this would be a motivator for those cities that are not uh, complying with that uh, state code. So the proposal would be. Uh, at least again, currently, right now, uh, is that the 20% of the bond must be released after a notification from the builder that we have not provided them a list and, uh, and that there's a cure period of five days. So uh, they request an inspection for the release of the bond. We go, we do a determination. We know what they need to fix we don't give them a list. They request, hey, you haven't given us the list after 15 days. We get five days to cure. And then if we don't do it, then we release the 20% of the bond. So with that being said, this is the question of how comfortable you feel with that. Yes. Thank you. You alluded to this um, in your your discussion for this piece, but I'm wondering for this issue and the previous one, can you approximate how many cities these builders are having these issues in? Not exactly, but I can say that I've had conversations and it's uh, about Six or seven is what I've been told. Okay, thank you. Yes, I <laughs> I get it. I get it. I'm with you. We'll wait for just a, a few more seconds here. Yes. Just clarification, 20% of the entire bond amount 20%. Or twenty percent of each item, like the culinary water or the storm drain improvements. Right now, it's twenty percent of the full, um, is what it is. Um, right now, can you categorize we can, it? We can do that. Yeah. Uh, 
All right, five more seconds here. Um, okay, moving on here. Impact fees. Uh, this is where we're at. Um, we are loading. Okay, we there's still a lot going on with impact fees. In fact, there's a meeting tomorrow where we'll be discussing it a lot further. So we are still uh, in the process here and wanted, but wanted to make you aware of that. Um, apparently, I'm 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 making problems here. There we there we go. Got it. Proud of me, Carson. Um, so the uh, the current uh, one of the one of the items that they are looking to change is the idea of if there's so if they challenge an impact fee calculation right now the sole remedy is a refund of the difference between what the person or entity paid as an impact fee and the amount the impact fee should have been if it had been correctly calculated. Uh, what they would like to add, and um, and I, I should, so this is the, the red, what you're seeing there is language that will be proposed back to them, but what they are, what they want is that uh, they want plus annual simple interest at the statutory rate. So there's a rate um, set in code that they would want that to be, uh, that difference, that statutory rate. Uh, like I said, this is getting pretty nitty gritty technical, but what this would do is allow them to receive also that interest that we received in the money that went to the, to, uh, that was invested in the PTIF to have that interest back on that incorrect amount. Um, any questions? Because I'm not sure that that was totally clear. Norm, thank you, Norm. I'm trying to understand what the quote incorrect amount is. What are we? What are we trying to get out? Are they trying to say we charged them 500 bucks and it only cost us 400 bucks? Because if we go the other way and we charge them 500 and it costs us 600, do we get the extra 100 from them plus interest? So you see where I'm going on this. There, it's nearly it's nearly impossible for us to track that impact fee that we got five and a half years ago. And all the interest that we got on it, we can track that. But then how does that apply to the project that we're now doing now that has doubled in cost? This is just ridiculous as far as I'm concerned. There's really no, and I'm fine. If they want to go the other way and we can collect more, let's do it. Todd. This statutory provision only applies to when they make a legal challenge to yes. an impact fee and they win in court. Yes. So there isn't a provision in the statute now for interest other than the judgment interest rate. And that's higher than what the PTIF is going to be in almost every circumstance. Even now, the judgment rate is still higher than PTIF. So um, I don't think it's unreasonable if we have... If, if a judgment is rendered against the city that says you collected too much in impact fees, it'll be the difference between the fee. The court is obligated to determine what the fee should have been. So there would be a delta there. We're saying, can we, are you comfortable with us saying we would pay interest at the PTIF rate on that delta? Thank you. So it would be after a legal challenge that that impact fee was incorrect and a determination that that impact fee was incorrect. So with that, here's the next question. Yes, Kevin. So for some of our impact fees, the proposal, and I, I'm, I don't know who that norm, 
uh, for a lot of our impact fees, that wouldn't work because you haven't adopted the higher amount, but for some of them, it would work. For instance, transportation impact fees that are based on the trip generation manual, that may actually work where they would have to pay the higher amount plus interest. So that would be my, my response to them is if, does that make sense? I'm not following. Our, no. Okay. So this might take a side conversation, but our impact fees are based off of the ITE trip generation manual. And so we have a lot of de developers that try to argue, well, you know, we don't have that many trips per day. And so that information that you're using to base your impact fee on is inaccurate. And we actually had a situation once where we entered into a settlement agreement <clears throat> and twice where it wasn't just if, if the trips were less, that the impact fee went down. It was if the trips were more, the impact fee went up. And we we're successful in both of those situations. So I think there'd be a way to build this in um, where you could legally ch uh, charge the higher impact fee as opposed to the lower amount. So if if this is something that we agree to, then I'd say it goes both ways. If you are if you can legally uh, charge the higher fee based on the IFFP and the IFA, IFA and the ordinance that was adopted, then I think it should go both ways. And that's that's uh, that's a great point, Kevin. And we can talk offline on that and and talk about the language because there are some uh, parts of the the amendments that are being proposed that uh, further define. Uh, that's what will be uh, included in those amendments is how we define how we determine a those individual different impact fees. So. Uh, we're in the middle of figuring that what that what that is. So let's let's talk offline about that specific language. And um, so thank you. Okay. Um, the next question uh, we may need a follow up on this, so you may see an email, but we still wanted to uh, pose it and see the response that we got. So just know that you might get a follow-up email on this to drill down into the details. Uh, the question is, in, in the code, encumber means a pledge to retire a debt or to an allocation to a current purchase order or contract. In order for, uh, on, on impact fees, we as cities have to spend or encumber those impact fees. You may not know uh, how your city views uh, and how they determine what it means to encumber, but we wanted to get an idea of uh, how your city, um, does it have to be in a budget, earmarked in a budget? Does it have to be in a capital facilities plan? Is it a, a uh, the intention by the city council to do so, but there's no ordinance, it's not in writing? Um, uh, the, the question or the concern by some are, well, uh, cities don't have this in their budget. They don't have it in, in the, their, their pledge is merely that we will, uh, use that money after six years. Um, and so that's that it's been pledged during those six years, but it hasn't been spent so what does, I guess, pledge mean in your city? You may or may not know. So, but we wanted to get a, an idea if you do know. So I would just say on this, the, the earmark in the budget doesn't really apply because we only budget a year in advance, right? I have a fire truck that's not gonna be here for three years. So that doesn't work for me, but we have encumbered it by, by an ordinance. By actually by a resolution for a purchase of the vehicle. So to me, that one's done. And so that's not on the list. I would say you need to probably add something like that on the list that it ought to be, it ought to be a direct action in my mind of a council taking, taking action, saying, this is what we intend to do. So let me follow up on that. Do you have any document that says within these six years, you're going to build these streets? I mean, that, do do you have do you have documents that say these are the capital facilities that you're going to build? That I know I've seen it in budget saying this is the projected infrastructure we're going to build, and it's going to be in this area with this development. 
Um, we, we don't get that granular on our, on our, some of ours, but okay. we do on others, right? So my public safety impact fee, we've encumbered it. We've got $400,000 sitting there that we now are, now are in, uh, obligated to 1.7 million. So we're, we're easily covered. It's not that big of a deal for us, but you're right. Maybe on the other ones, like water lines and streets, we, we don't get that granular because we don't know where those streets are going to be going. Right. It's all a matter of uptake for the developers in whatever area. Okay. That's helpful. Todd. Um, in trying to respond to the Slido question, I think there's multiple provisions that would apply on what would be considered encumbered. So um, it's only allowing me to pick one where I think, again, there's there's a couple ones. That's that. when you don't, you forgot to involve Carson, okay? Real quick, the one that talks about the capital project is in the general plan. Was that meant to be a capital facilities plan or an IFFP instead of a general plan? Um, well, the, 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 what I was getting at there, I mean, th that is one option. That is one other option is whether it's in the facilities plan, right? Mm -hmm. um, the, the, uh, what I was getting that at there is, is the city planning in their general plan to do those, to do, to have those facilities in that specific area? Um, some may rely on that. Some may say that's enough for us to, to, uh, to meet that definition of pledge. Appreciate the question. It's too confusing with your answers. So I wouldn't base any response or take any action based on this list. I, I think you're, you're honing in on a really important question, which is a better definition for spend or encumber. But typically, we all should be considering, you know, when we do a land acquisition, if it's for, say, a tank or a pond or something like that, well, you can spend the first money that you collected early on in the process and acquire the land. So sure. you've spent it. Sure. And then you can do your design work, and that's going to spend it. And that's going to also encumber it when you go onto your contract. And, you know... It, it, it's the, te the, the window is pretty critical, but it's how you start to allocate those funds during that process. And so to your question, there's not a clear answer up there that's correct, but I think there's multiple ways that we need to look at it. And I, I agree the concept that defining that should be um, a standard definition, but I just don't want you to run off using this Slido sure. question as your, as your guiding factor. If it makes any difference, we debated on whether to put this up or not. So, well, who was voting against it? Because they were right. I was. Um. So let me let me get a. a oh, I'm over time. Sorry, Kim. Uh, I just got the the nod. Well, I'm done. Um. Uh. No, I'm not. I'm going to ask this question. So. Uh, how often do you have to return impact fees because the infrastructure has not been constructed or encumbered within six years? I want to know how often that happens in your city. Because what, why I'm asking that question is, is because there will be language or proposed language that uh, really uh, hits around that six year mark. And if it's not a problem for cities to spend or encumber that money before the six years, then it's less of a problem in the language that we need to negotiate. Mark, don't tell me you don't like this question. You can't say that. I, I, I hate why you're asking the question, but not the question. No, I, I think the interesting part of, of looking at this, though, is, is in a high growth community, we have projects that we're constantly amending to our impact fee facilities plan because a developer pops in and says, hey, we're going to build here. And all of a sudden, we now need to prioritize a water drinking line that needs to be upsized to go through their development. And so... Um, the nature of it is, is we're updating our impact fees about every year and a half anyway, and we're adding projects in. And once that project's built, now that's an encumbrance that's taking place. And so I, I, I get what you're going for, but it's it's not always black and white what that six-year window looks like. Um, 
And generally, we're trying to plan for infrastructure and we're spending money on the projects that we have. But we also can't guarantee that the developers are going to pull all the permits necessary in that same window. So right. spending it and encumbering it is the critical goal for us. We just need to make sure that whatever legislation we take on, we've got the ability to do the partial a, um, the partial work on the project that we can at various points so that we are spending that money down. And I'd be hesitant to commit to anything that says the entire project will be built within that six year window. Uh, if, sure. if you kind of see where I'm going with that. Yeah. Um, let's talk further, turn the time over to Cam. Perfect. Thank you, everybody, for your feedback there on land use task force items. Um, I want to make a couple of quick notes because Mark asked a really good question a moment ago about how we use the Slido data. Uh, Carson basically does a report for us as staff after each time we do Slido, whether it's LPC or annual convention, otherwise. And then we go through it. We look at the individual results. We we break them down by uh, class of city, we'll break them down in, in other ways so we can see the different trends. So Mark, when you talk about you know, a rapid growth community, we'll view it this way, and that may be different than how a more built out community looks at it. That's how we'll track the slide of results as well. And because there's not a bill in front of you to say, here's the specific language, the slide helps us get general direction or feedback on different things that helps in the negotiations. Okay, so the last big item here, um, since we did the revenue all, already is in the Michigan Housing Affordability. The final schedule, Charles, you'll see on the agenda is November 5th. Uh, that's also election day for those of you keeping track at home. And you have seen both presidential candidates really lean into housing policy over the last few weeks. There have been multiple hearings at the congressional level. So the pressure we've been feeling here locally is, is uh, going all over the country. Uh, thanks to Cassidy for helping me try to visualize this and help you visualize this. These are all the different groups that are right now in the statewide planning space. You have the state housing plan, which I'll talk about in a moment. They're planning that Steve Waldrip and Laura Hansen, in the governor's office. They intend to unveil the framework of the state housing plan by the time the session starts in January. You have the Commission of Land Use and Commission on Housing Affordability and Land Use Task Force. And just to emphasize the timing here. The Land Use Task Force meets tomorrow and then meets again on November 5th, the morning of the CHA, and then the afternoon is the CHA. So what's, you know, the feedback you're giving us today will help us as we're negotiating in both of those spaces, and both of those are geared toward legislation in January. Oh, computer. Okay. The the red is legislators who are bringing their own bills. So Representative Ray Ward presented two bills to interim next week. We'll be presenting those to you here shortly. Envision Utah has received the uh, grant to do the infrastructure and housing capacity. The timing of that I'll talk about momentarily. And then on top of that, you have the governor's transition team, which wants a document ready by January. You have the GOEO Vision 2034 through the UEOC that Mary Don Ramsey represents us on. And then Salt Lake Chamber, working with all the chambers of Utah Rising. All of those have housing and planning components. And we're trying to be involved in all of them and coordinate them as much as possible. So for example, here's the Envision Utah piece. Uh, they've had their initial meetings and you can see the recommendations and final report is scheduled for next summer. Uh, we had the first meeting with them uh, a couple of weeks ago where we were talking about the uh, both the current data and future data as well as past data around infrastructure and housing starts. This is just an example of, of data that we've collected with our partner cities in Southwest Salt Lake County, Northern Utah County. Norm, can I put you on the spot briefly and just uh, we give a quick overview of, of this conversation and also the meeting we had with uh, you and a few other cities with Steve Waldrop talking about infrastructure? Yeah, thanks, Cam. So we we met a couple of weeks ago with uh, myself and the representative from Santa Clara and Salt Lake City, right? Mm -hmm. uh, yep. With the with the infrastructure group. It was interesting to me that I got invited the day before from Cam that no cities were invited to that. So I'm not sure how they're going to study infrastructure without having any input from cities that operate and maintain these. Well, they do now because system. we got they, in the room. They, they yeah. do now. I would like to thank Cam for that. I, I still think there needs to be more representation, but at least we've got some folks on there, so that's good. That, as he indicated in his time frame, we're just barely at the beginning. They plan on doing 
what they're calling interviews with stakeholders, which was everybody on the on the call. I've not received anything on that. I don't know if Salt Lake or Santa Clara has received anything. So as soon as we do that, we'll we'll attend those and find out what the what their thoughts are there. Uh, two weeks ago, we met with uh, myself, Cam, Orem City officials, both elected and appointed, and Mark Christensen and myself met with Steve Waltrip in Orem. And I, I wanted to, I, I just wanted to go through a couple of things on that, Cam. I hope it's okay if I take a couple of minutes on that. But Steve said something that was very, very poignant to me. He he basically said, and I'm, I'm going to paraphrase here because I didn't write it down, but he basically said, we've got to do something to change the narrative because the legislatures drive by your cities at 80 miles an hour, my city, for instance, Santa Quin, on their way to St. George, and they think they know what's happening in Santa Quin, and they don't. And so we, we've got to change that narrative. And so with Steve, I, I gave some talking points. I said, Steve... You recognize that little tiny old Santa Quin in 15 years was out of 3,000 units. Now, Mark looks at that and goes, oh, that was last year. But <laughs> seriously, I mean, we went from 20, 2,300 units to over 5,000 units in 15 years. Show me another uh, uh, city that had a $4.5 million budget then and a $12 million budget now. We, we bonded for $44 million worth of infrastructure. Now that's general fund budget, obviously, but the, the reality of it is, is that we need to tell our story. I love that Cam and, and, and the league has put out the 190 number and the 130 number of all the ones that have been built over the last five or 10 years. But the reality of it is, is that we as cities need to get down into the weeds with our legislators. I love what Provo City, I don't know if Provo's here. I love what Provo City did uh, a week and a half ago. They, they had a Provo City Housing Summit where they invited all of their legislators uh, in the city as well as the state legislators on that. And it was a really good conversation to say, here, here's what we're doing and here's what we're talking about and here's the things that we're looking at trying to do. I, I think as individual cities, we need to be doing that. We need to be, and Cam and, and his group, his, his team has uh, said this for years, we need to have relationships with our legislators. We plan to do a similar invite to our legislators and have them down to show them some of the things that we've done. Again, 3,000 units in 15 years, right? We've got, um, again, $44 million in debt. If I were to build out Santa Quin City today and in, in, in less than to, today's dollars to build out for all of my uh, public improvements, I need a half a billion dollars. Does that scare anybody half to death? On a $12 million budget, I'm not sure how we're going to do that. I'm not sure how the developers are going to do that. But the reality of it is, is there's a whole, I, my, my, my statement to Steve was, all the easy and cheap stuff is gone. Now it's going to be very, very expensive, very, very challenging, farther away from utilities, higher up or lower down in wetlands, higher up in the elevation, that kind of thing. I, I We just need to get our stories out there. We need to, I, I would encourage you as cities to invite your legislators to come and, and see the things that you've done and show them what you're doing to help with housing and show them all that you've entitled and, and that type of thing. The other thing is really quick. We have a right, right now I could, I could increase in 10%, 10.5% in two weeks in my city. Cause I've got 546 building permits that could be picked up in two weeks. Why aren't they coming to get them? That's obviously a market issue and that kind of thing. But the reality of it is, is we need to be, we need to be showing the legislators what we're doing. Do you know in Santa Quin that 31% of our growth, that 3,000 units, 31% of those were multifamily attached units? Going from a, a city that had 2,300 homes and probably two small condo projects to, to having 31% of the growth, that's phenomenal. And, and our legislators need to see that kind of thing. Perfect. Thank you, Norm. And you mentioned Provo. Here's Provo Santa. If everybody wants to see it, it was tremendously done. Uh, but it is important to fill in that gap. As I mentioned, there are all these different groups working in the policy planning space and housing space. I'm going to focus for a moment on the state housing plan. I uh, appreciate Norm and Mark and Orm and, and Provo and Spanish Fork who all met with Steve that afternoon. The State housing plan principles are these. Now, this is this is a draft document. So what we're sharing with you right now, we've been authorized to share with you. Uh, but these are the principles behind the draft document. And again, the timing here is they want to unveil the framework by January. And I think it's really important. Collaboration over preemption is the first principle in the draft document. The second is this holistic and regional approach. And before anybody asks me any questions like, what does that mean? That's still up in the air about what does that mean? Uh, you may have heard Steve Waldrop talk about, we have a great uh, great approach in Utah about how we plan regionally for transportation needs. Is there a way to replicate that 
on the housing and land use space. And it's an unanswered question, but you may hear Steve, uh, you may hear Steve bring that up. And that's one of the principles herein. And then you can see the other principles that are all pretty consistent with the sort of messages that we have been pushing at the Capitol. So what does success look like in the state housing plan? Well, first and foremost, increasing the housing supply. And then you can see what that looks like in, in a variety of spaces. Again, draft housing plan, it's not for public consumption yet. Please don't tweet this. We're authorized to share share this. Now, this piece is from the Commission on Housing Affordability. This document was presented last week. So you can't tweet this if you want, but this came from the Commission on Housing Affordability. This is what we will be bringing back to the League Board in two weeks. And so we have a few more Slido questions to ask you in our last 12 minutes, 12, 15 minutes here, because all the feedback you've given us throughout the summer and fall, we've been aggregating to be able to come back to the board and say, membership was okay here. I thought this was a good idea. Membership is a hard no here. This is a bad idea. And so we can finalize on November 4th, two weeks from today, the board's recommendations that then we can take back to the commission the next day on the 5th. So these are the items that Senator Lincoln Fillmore and Representative Stephen White presented to their colleagues last week that they were looking at in the public land space or publicly owned land and legacy cities, um, the zoning, zoning and uh, development process, different types of housing supply, and then what data is still missing that needs to be um, needs to be built. This is a picture of the proposal that we uh, showed you a couple months ago, and I want to just give you an update. This is in West Weber County. This is a Nielsen Homes project. Again, I'm not saying, I'm not endorsing it one way or the other. What I am saying is that this project is the first project to receive the House Bill 572 funding from last session, where it had to meet certain targets around ownership and affordability in order to receive the, those state dollars. And the uh, the groundbreaking for this project, uh, the governor will be in attendance for it in a couple of weeks. So we've heard both in the Commission on Housing Affordability and from the governor and others that for single family detached, this is what success looks like, is having a mix of housing units in the development, uh, the smaller units, smaller lots, but also larger units, larger lots, but interspersed. Uh, one with another, and then ha having deed restrictions for ownership and, and affordability. Okay, these are the league principles that we've articulated many times, but we need to keep emphasizing, and we look through everything in the housing space through these principles. Okay, so here's here's where we're at as of October 21st at 1.42 p.m. So the concepts that the league board will be considering next week that really apply to, to all cities would be looking at publicly owned uh, real estate. So state, county, city, school district, et cetera, but with some parameters around that, uh, recognizing really the focus here is on what surplus land is there that's publicly owned that could be utilized for housing. And the parameters would be around those definitions of what is surplus versus what is being planned for future use. Uh, we brought to you a proposal in August, and I've got an update for you here around parking reductions for deed restricted affordable units. Senator Fillmore and Representative White still would like some sort of statutory standard for what a parking stall is in a residential area. We've not gotten um, anywhere close to yes on that one yet. That's why it's still TBD. Uh, modern income housing plans. Carson's been meeting with a bunch of planners, some of whom are attending this meeting, uh, because there's going to be some changes, at least on the reporting side. And the goal is ultimately to make it better uh, rather than just changing it for the sake of changing it. Infrastructure tools and data. I mean, Norm's point was was well said and impact a lot of cities in that same space. Like we have all these in infrastructure needs. How do we unlock those? And last year, that was really the big focus of last session with the FIS and the HOPS and House Bill 572 was to provide those revenue streams. Uh, we're trying to fix definitions and then enabling language about affordable owner occupied locally imposed overlays. So we're going to ask a slide question about that here in a moment. Then specifically for legacy cities, rapid growth cities, resort communities, you know, the, in the legacy city case, that's where you see a lot of interest for trying to get condominiums rather than apartments in centers. And then because there's not much appetite with the governor or with legislative leadership around extending the down payment assistance program for first time home buyers to existing housing units, we've had conversations instead at the Capitol around revolving loan funds for house renovation for home buyers who buy units that maybe are rental today, but then they buy them as ownership units tomorrow and they 
can access some money for um, home renovation. Uh, Ogden City has been doing this since 1991, right, Janine? Uh, and Ogden's, Ogden's model has renovated quite a few houses over the last 25 years. And so is there a way to take what Ogden's been doing and do it at scale for, for legacy cities? Rapid growth, this would be technical assistance. So this isn't necessarily for the Saratogas of the rapid growth space. It's really for the next the next layer of community that's not right in the middle of the growth, but has the growth right on their doorstep, helping with technical assistance. And then resort communities, we talked about short-term rental data and the tourism taxes a moment ago. So we asked you this question last time, uh, last or last month, around whether we should wait some MIHP menu items where you're focused on ownership tools, because the existing MIHP menu is pretty silent around ownership. So this is what we listed for you, and, and we're gonna we'll share with you right now what the survey results were. So, 53% responded you'd be very comfortable or somewhat comfortable um, with this concept. So this concept, if you had to do at least one ownership-focused action, it could be um, an HTRZ, it could be the ownership overlay. Uh, Mayor Ramsey, you'll notice we had, did change the wording because before, last month it said adopt or propose, and it's now adopt, propose, administer, so that it's it's ongoing credit there. So 53% said very comfortable, somewhat comfortable, uh, but, only, but Carson, I believe it was only 13% were in the concern space, everybody else was in the uncertain space. So based on your feedback from last month, um, well, I'll, well, I'll come back to that in a second. So then we have this, uh, the next question that we asked, this we actually asked at the annual convention, and we had about 300 responses to this one, so more than a normal LPC. Would your city be willing to adopt an overlay that gives more incentives in exchange for guaranteed affordable owner-occupied housing? And 58% of you came back and said, yes, we either already have one or yes, support of the concept, but want to know more details. And again, only a small fraction said no, there was a significant amount of undecided. Mm -hmm. So what we've done as staff, again, building toward two weeks from now, is we've been working on, okay, what can these proposals potentially look like? So this, we're going to ask you the slide questions here in a moment, and we'll be sending these out as well. But we want your feedback this week so we can aggregate it, analyze it, and then come back to the board two weeks from today and say, the membership has said this path makes sense or this path does not make sense, okay? So there are two concepts here, two potential proposals. One's focused single family detached, one on multifamily. On the single family detached, this is very similar to what a lot of communities do with development agreements anyway, but there's been a lot of back and forth behind the scenes with a lot of our own city attorneys about whether you could do this just in base zoning. There's some, anyway, I'll spare you the legal back and forth, but the thought was, do we just do some enabling language. Normally we shy away from enabling language because under our legal framework in Utah, we don't need to ask permission from the legislature to act as cities unless the legislature has already stepped in and said you can or can't do that. But in this case, there's enough ambiguity and uncertainty here that it would may make sense to just clarify exactly what we mean. So proposal one would be the city says, we'll give you at least this density but then we can require a percentage to be affordable, owner-occupied, or limited in size and, and mass. So if you didn't want to do a deed restriction and just wanted to require a smaller unit, you could you could do that um, so long as you as you met um, kind of the, the base density piece. Proposal two is focused more on the multifamily piece. So this would be often an infill and in centers. So essentially, in your multifamily zoning code, you could have two two tracks. Track number one would be for apartment units, rental units. Track number two would be for condominium units. Because in the meetings we've been having with the condo work group, uh, one issue that has come up has been that, uh, well, we've been working through building codes and liability and financial issues. But one piece that's come up is if we could, if you could actually do a bigger building for condos, it makes it easier for the condo to pencil than with a traditional uh, multifamily rental product. Okay. I've, we're running short on time. We're asking these questions in this meeting and there'll be a follow-up. So we want as much feedback as possible in the next few days as we're building this out for the board meeting. So let's go ahead and start with this one. Would, you be, would your city be willing to enact an ordinance allowing single family detached homes density of at least six 
units to the acre with an affordable ownership component and then apply it in residential zones where appropriate. So this would not be the state imposing it on top of the city, but it would be the city saying, okay, we'll figure out our own ownership overlay. This is what it looks like for our city and this is where it would make sense in our city. So I'll leave that open. Again, this is focused on single family detached and then we'll ask a second question that's focused on the condos piece. While this question is open, I'll see if there are any questions. Carson, I see a bunch of things on the chat room, but I assume you're handling that. Great. Okay, Carson, due to time, I'm just going to keep going, right? They can still be answering it. Okay, the second one, this is the, the condos question. So would your city be willing to enact an ordinance that provides incentives for affordable owner-occupied condos instead of apartments in your multifamily zones where appropriate? So again, focused on condos, you know, center-style development as opposed to single-family detached. So I'll leave this open for a moment, and then I have three more Slido questions to go before we are before we're out of time here. So I'll leave this open for another couple of moments. Councilmember Petro, um, I appreciate all the thought going into it, but. The tools that we're taking given, um, I think it's bigger than what we're starting to be. We're largely tested because it's not powerful unless we start using developers who kind of like the most developers. Can I just pause you? We'll get the mic. People online can hear you. <laughs> <laughs> nope, you're good. <laughs> Thank you. Um, I was just saying, I'm I'm really thankful for frameworks like these, and 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 I'm real supportive of it. I'm worried that the tools that we have available to us are not as powerful or tested as we need them to be. And so I'm thinking particularly of the HTRZ. We have one approved, and in the HTRZ that we just approved, I'm working with like two of the most recent developers. If it's possible, to make it work. These are the two who are going to make it work. And they're still telling me that they're coming up against a wall. They still need LIHTC. They still need all of those other trappings in order to make the affordability work. So as we're doing this, while I'm supportive of the framework, I'm also wanting some caveats that protect us in case the thing to achieve is the fault of a tool and not of a municipality yeah. doing the due diligence and work they need to. Yeah, ex excellent points. And ultimately, policy alone doesn't move, doesn't move the needle because policy alone doesn't fund infrastructure. Right. So excellent point. Excellent point. Okay. Uh, next item. This again is following back up with you. So in, in August, we presented, I, we presented and put on the screen a proposal to where we would say we're willing to reduce garage requirements in exchange for deed restricted affordable housing. And the proposal we put forward to you needed four slides and we surveyed it and the feedback that came back was very, very mixed. So we went back to the drawing board based on the feedback. Now it all fits on one slide. So that's better if nothing else. And uh, the gist of it here is owner occupied affordable housing. We can't, we would not be able to impose a garage carport requirement, which would save money up front on the development costs. But then that savings would go to the home buyer because those units would have to be deed restricted to be affordable owner occupied. And then for, housing units that are not deed restricted owner occupied if the city requires a garage carport we have to count all of the fully structurally accessible spots um, that was the one piece we had about 80 percent of the league board said they were comfortable with that concept so we've tweaked it based on the feedback at lpc and then count tandem as two spots so the back-to-back -back tandem so long as it meets that criteria so simplified it based on your feedback in August, but this gets to the conversations happening at the Commission on Housing Affordability around if the outcome is the deed restricted affordable owner occupied units, then are we willing on our side to say, yeah, we'll require a little less on the garage and on the carport covered parking side. And I know a lot of cities don't even require garages um, now and the market builds them anyway. So 
Yes, <laughs> but this is getting to the, the trade-off piece. Okay, so here's the Slido question for, for this one as well. So we'll leave this open shortly and I only have two more to go. So we'll leave this open. Then the question here is focused on the owner-occupied affordable, affordable piece. Can't require the covered parking, but it, and this would not apply to apartment buildings, would not apply to multifamily, just a one or two family mm -hmm. dwelling. So it's getting to kind of that definition of success in the picture I showed you earlier around the detached single family. It would, that's where it would apply. Is Mark. Is property or is it only those portable Yeah, so the question Mark's asking is about the, the, the where does this apply to? So. Carson, if I go back a slide, it's not going to screw up the survey results, right? Uh, okay. oh. I don't know if you I'll just leave it. I'll, I'll just leave it. I don't want to screw it up half, halfway through. So the mark, the, the our our willingness to reduce the covered parking requirement would be tied to that particular unit being deed, either deed restricted to be affordable or unoccupied, or however else you know the land use authority chose to do it, right? the the trade-off here is okay that unit may build a garage in the future because our proposal said you could still require on-site parking so you still need to have two unit or two stalls for the unit but maybe it's not a garage but the savings from the garage ideally get passed on to the home buyer because of the deed restriction otherwise can you clarify it's not reducing the overall off-street requirement just yeah that, yeah so you if you if your city requires two off-street parking spots and right now requires two off-street to be covered, you could still require the two. You just want to require them to be covered so long as the outcome is the owner-occupied affordable unit. So again, it's trying to get to that trade-off, uh, which the market may or may not respond to. That's outside of our control. Okay. Carson, I'm going to let you do a quick update here, and then I'll do my last two slides. I know we're a few minutes over, but just hang with us for about five more minutes. All right. So modern income housing plan changes. I know uh, there's a collective groan every time I say that. Um, there's You heard the policy discussions that Cam was mentioning about the weighted menu item. This is actually sort of a separate effort. The, the political subdivisions interim committee has a bill filed to try to respond to some of the um, legislative audit recommendations, and two of those that are related to modern income housing plans are first um, a better better uh, system for uh, statewide strategic planning and coordination. Some of that's the plan that Cam mentioned. Some of that's just actual metrics. How does the state know if there are any policies are working? And with all the changes to modern income housing plans, it's actually been very difficult over the years to be able to track that progress. Um, the other piece of it is expanding modern income housing plans to include a forecasting benchmark for growth. Um, and so I wanted to address these. This is, again, specific to the political subdivisions response. These are the two most, um, I think, clear points that the legislative auditors pointed out. The first on that is um, trying to come up with a better reporting mechanism. Right now, the reports are very narrative based. We all know that your planners spend a lot of time submitting them. So um, DWS is also very interested in trying to reduce the amount of time they spend reviewing that mm -hmm. and trying to make it more uh, measurable and um, a little bit more objective. So I'm not exactly sure what that looks like, but that's kind of the effort to make to streamline that reporting process, make it easier, make it uh, a better metric for everybody. Mm -hmm. um, and then the second point is on forecasting. And I want to be very clear, these are not targets. This is planning forecasting. Mm -hmm. Um, this is actually a requirement in the modern income housing plans for a long time prior to 2021. Uh, old modern income housing plans, and some actually still do this, um, are state the number of housing units you expect to need at uh, 30, 50, and 80 percent of very median income. Um, the recommendations I've seen look very similar to that, just saying in your MIHP, you have to identify what your what your kind of like expected growth rates are for housing. Um, and there's been a lot of issues in the past with data here because everybody uses ACS data, which is based on uh, five year or three year or one year prior. So that gets a, kind of tricky to uh, to know real time changes. So um, basically there's a group that's been put together to try to work on this. It's possible that there'll be some additional changes to MIHP from this group, but uh, the feedback I've heard from planners and I spent most of my time at APA talking to people. So um, if, you're, if you're listening or if your planners are listening, uh, thank you for all that. Um, but one of the one of the goals that I heard loud and clear was 
let's not make substantive changes to the like the actual menu items until we know what's happening more at the state level. Uh, most cities are still three or four years into their implementation plan that you made back, back in uh, 2022. Um, so trying to focus on technical report changes this year rather than substantive strategy changes. Um, there's been lots of conversations around MIHP, so expect this to keep evolving. We'll keep you posted and we'll keep um, talking to you and your planners for guidance to try to figure out how to make this process better and less painful for everybody. Perfect. Thank you, Carson. Okay. Last item. Representative Ward last week presented on two concepts to the Political Subdivisions Committee. And I want to publicly thank Representative Jim Dunnigan, who's the uh, co chair of that committee. Uh, Representative Dunnigan had several very pointed questions around infrastructure and respecting the role of, of local government. So thank you to Representative Dunnigan, who's a former council member, and that definitely showed in his comments. But then in Friday Facts, we also outlined a bunch of other legislators who spoke up with really good questions about the impact of state top-down zoning would have on infrastructure and on, and on uh, neighborhoods and the like. So Representative Ward presented two options. One was basically buy right small lots, and the other was buy right ADUs. And the committee was more receptive on the ADU front than they were on the buy right um, small lot front. There's a lot of focus at the Capitol, like how do you get more small lots and hopefully more small units and hopefully more affordable units therein. Uh, but they they had a, a lot of questions around the, uh, the buy right small lot proposal. With ADUs, several of them said, I don't like this other proposal, but I'm open to the idea of state action on ADUs to make sure that ADUs are, are allowed in as many places as possible. So here are some of the different things that have that came up during that, that meeting, uh, some of which actually appears in a lot of ordinances because we estimate that about uh, two thirds to three quarters of MIHP cities, so cities above 5,000 population allow AD, um, detached ADUs already. And it's usually based on this type of criteria, lot size, the ADU, ADU shares a lot, single family detached unit, which could be subdivided later. Um, and I probably should have just put in quotes there, Farmington, because the Farmington, uh, the Farmington process of having the ADU get built and then subdivided turns it into a small lot type um, subdivision. The ADU is smaller in height and mass than the initial single family dwelling. At least one of them is owner occupied, setbacks and in infrastructure. So the, the second to last slide question we have for you today is how would you how do you feel about the idea separate from Representative Ward's bill? Because Representative Ward's bill is currently drafted, it's just ADUs in all residential zones in counties of the first and second class. But you know, external ADUs and single family detached lots larger than 10,000 square feet that meets that prior criteria that I showed a second ago. And where where does that fall on the line for you? Because again, this is something we've heard from the from the co-chairs uh, that they want to keep looking at over these next few weeks. So we'll leave that open and then I will go to our last question and we'll be done. I apologize for keeping you late, but as we told you, there's a lot of moving parts between now and when we'll meet again. And so we wanted to make sure we got as much feedback as possible from the group. Um, Justin, is there anything else you needed to bring up uh, before we, I've got the one last catch-all question, but otherwise I can turn back to Kate when I'm done. You mentioned we'll send a follow-up survey. Yeah, we will have a follow-up survey either later today, ideally later today, where you'll have all these same questions at your fingertips. Again, we have got meetings tomorrow on the land use technical items. So that's our top priority timing wise. But then we've got the board meeting two weeks from today. And so we need feedback this week on all the other items. Okay, so then the last question is this. Is there anything else you'd like the league board to consider as they finalize our positions within the Commission on Housing Affordability and Land Use Task Force? Uh, uh, let me make a couple of quick comments here. One, Senator Fillmore and Representative White, the co-chairs of the Commission on Housing Affordability, have acknowledged several times this summer how much work has been done the last few years. Senator Fillmore and committee just last week said, we have done a lot and we need to see what actually is going to work. Uh, so we've driven that message home at every turn. The second piece I mentioned, or I showed you that slide a moment ago, of like all the different planning concepts. We have been also driving home the point of before we make lots of policy changes this session, we need to figure out where all these state 
the housing plans are going first. And there's an acknowledgement there too, that those need to be coordinated and aligned. So the feedback you're giving us today and this week is helpful, not just for the potential legislation, but for trying to stay on top of all of those moving pieces around those plans and you know, brace yourself for a lot to come in November and December as we lead up into the session. Uh, last thing I'll say is uh, this is the last time we will all meet uh, before the Utah BYU football game, which uh, I'm grateful for that. Uh, I'm great. I'm grateful for that. Kudos to yeah, kudos to, to BYU. And I did offer repeatedly and angrily on Saturday to be the offensive coordinator for Utah. They did not take me up on it. They hired an intern today, so I'll still be here. With that, Kate, you're still here. I'll turn it to you for for your favorite motion. I am prepared to accept a final motion from this August group. All right, I see a motion to adjourn. Do we have a second? You guys all wanna stay? Oh, okay, I see a second up there. All right, all in favor, please say aye. We are adjourned, see you later.